Uh, two short questions. First, the uh, Waxman uh, Markey bill, which you favor, uh, uses, I believe, uh, cap and trade carbon uh, credits, if you will. Yes. Uh, why not a straight carbon tax. tax, which is far easier to implement, the proceeds of which could be used to reduce other taxes as, a, as offsets? Yeah. That's number one. Number two is have you considered uh, or does your organization favor the use of biofuels, which, uh, which is, uh, while they burn carbon, uh, are renewable? because they burn plants, and also the plants in growing absorb carbon dioxide, so leaving the net carbon level fairly close to, uh, to zero. Uh, both good questions. On the first uh, question on a carbon tax and why a cap and trade versus a carbon tax, there are two reasons for that. On, um, the first answer is that the purpose of a cap is to put a limit on the amount of carbon emissions, and it's a declining cap. So our objective is to decrease carbon emissions 80% by 2050. A declining cap that ratchets down the amount of emissions every year annually will allow you to reach that objective. So it, it actually, the cap is designed to reach the environmental objective, which is to reduce carbon emissions. And a tax can create resources, and it's Perhaps, I mean, people argue whether it's simple or not. The tax code in the United States is enormously complex, so I wouldn't necessarily agree that it's that easy. But you know, that's why we favor a carbon tax from a uh, policy standpoint. I mean, a, car a carbon cap from a policy standpoint. The other reason is this is the United States of America. I don't know one elected official who is going to get up and support a tax. That just doesn't happen. Everybody runs against away from taxes, and so you know, if if the leaders in our country, including the President of the United States, said carbon tax, we would evaluate that and we might support it. But that isn't what the discussion's about. The President is in favor of a cap. The leaders in Congress are in favor of a cap. What our job is to try to figure out how you design a cap to actually reach the environmental objectives. So that's why we support a carbon cap. Um, the second question, biofuels. Biofuels is a very complicated issue. There's a tremendous ability to grow crops in the United States. Crops can uh, supply uh, fuel and energy, and there's no doubt about that. There are also environmental ramifications from biofuels. And so, you know, like my answer to the nuclear question, it's, it's not a yes or no answer. It's a, as biofuels policies are designed, they have to be designed in such a way that the environment is protected, that our natural systems can continue to operate so that we don't go full bore into running cutting down every forest in America to supply the biofuels. So it's a more nuanced, how do we manage biofuels going forward? And we think it's part of the solution, but we also think how they're managed is as important to promoting them. And so since there's tremendous enthusiasm for biofuels, particularly out here in the corn economy, our job there is to work more on the environmental impacts then on the promotion, they don't need us. They're, they've got their very powerful advocates out there. So we're concerned about the environmental consequences. And in our work in Congress, that's what we focus on. What countries have been more effective in controlling carbon emissions? And how has it impacted their quality of life? Well, you know, the great example, of course, is a small country. It's not um, nearly as uh, complex as the United States. But take Denmark, for example. And uh, I went to Denmark. Uh, three summers ago to look at wind because we're big advocates of wind but there's not a lot of wind that you can see in the United States so I wanted to go see a country that actually had unleashed the power of wind and Denmark has. They get 20% of their energy from renewable energy resources. That's a huge amount. We're down in the single digits and we have you know, a huge amount of, uh, of possibility there. So, you know, I put Denmark first, but it's not the only country. If you go to uh, Spain or you go to Germany, you could see, I mean, ironically, Germany has unleashed the power of solar. And I was at a presentation recently with a man from uh, Europe who was talking about sustainability, and he's showing all these solar panels on homes all across Germany, and they're actually California products. So, you know, we're, we're designing them here, we're making them here, but we're not installing them here. And that is what we have to change. We're at the cutting edge of energy solutions, of 
clean energy products, but they're being installed in other parts of the world because we haven't put the policies in place to unleash that opportunity here. And that's what we think is misguided and crazy and what we have to turn around. Francis, uh, it, although Heck Dahl wants us to concentrate just on Ohio, tell us a little bit, going back to your earlier remarks, about what's happening to the oceans. Well, the, thank you, bud. Well, the oceans, uh, I, the oceans are in serious decline worldwide. Uh, I think probably a lot of people here are familiar with that. 90% of the large fish of the sea have been overfished. They're gone. So, you know, when you think of great majestic fish in the sea, there aren't any. And we've really um, fished out our oceans. But the good news about oceans is those resources are renewable. And there are strategies that can do that, but you just have to put them in place. So for example, one of the things that we're promoting are marine protected areas along the coast, along the east coast and the west coast. California, which is often at the cutting edge of environmental policy, has put in place some of these MPAs. And what happens, an interesting example is Iceland. During World War II, the waters around Iceland were off limits because of um, you know, the conflict over the navies and from Germany and the United States, et cetera. So what was a very, very powerful fishing nation, basically no fishing went on for about five years. The fishing stocks around Iceland at that time rebounded to an untold number. It was really quite extraordinary. So, and another place uh, off of um, Cape Canaveral, which is not Cape Canaveral, whatever it's called now, Cape what? Kennedy, Kennedy Cape Kennedy. Um, another area that's off limits because of the rockets that are going off, all that, and if you go into the offshore area around Cape Kennedy, there's untold marine resources because no one's harvesting them. So we actually know how to replenish the oceans, but it takes real policies and um, implementation and enforcement, which is now actually possible because with satellites and planes and observers, you can actually see what's happening. Uh, in the ocean, and so you can hold uh, fishing nations accountable. So, you know, I'm actually optimistic about the oceans over the near term because it's not as fraught with conflict as some of these other issues. I think, you know, with a little bit of ingenuity and commitment, we can actually manage our ocean resources in a sensible way. And as more and more information gets out on the serious plight, um, I think we'll, we'll get ahead of that one. With one challenging exception, although I hope it doesn't end up being an exception, and that's the Arctic Ocean. The Arctic Ocean is the seventh ocean of the world, when they talk about the seven seas of the world. It's the one that's not developed. Why is it not developed? Because it's been covered by ice from time immemorial. As the ice melts, suddenly the gold rush will take over, and the marine transport, oil and gas drilling, fisheries are going to just rush in there. And those interests already want to rush in there. So what we're advocating is a system of international ocean governance where the center of that Arctic Ocean would be managed in an integrated ecological system, not this plan for the oil and gas and this plan for the fish and this plan for the marine transport. But look at the whole environment and figure out how do we maintain this gem of an ocean that has had the benefit of being off limits to our um, use, you know, since human beings came onto the planet. So, you know, that I'm hoping actually that that's an issue that's going to capture the public's imagination, and we'll be able to uh, move policies on that. How about a certification? I'll get you off the Thank you so much. Thanks for all these Today at the City Club of Cleveland Forum, we've been listening to Francis Beinecke, President of the Natural Resources Defense Council. Thank you, Francis. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, the Edelsteins. This forum is now adjourned. For information on upcoming speakers or for podcasts of the City Club, go to cityclub.org.